Welcome everyone, episode 304, Aussie Tech Heads, 23rd of August. It's uh, footy season's nearly over, finals are nearly upon us, yee-haw. Uh, welcome listeners and welcome listeners around Australia and all around the world for that matter. Uh, the, the show, the Aussie Tech Heads, of course we've got the Aussie Tech Heads hosting, go check it out at hosting.aussietechheads.com.au and welcome to The Lounge, who join us every week without fail, live.thesecrethub.com.au, uh, well, no, sorry, live.thesecrethub.com, isn't it? Getting too many AUs uh, in my head. But uh, yeah, come and join us. If you haven't already, come on over. Now, the video of the show, that can be, uh, can be viewed after the show finishes at uh, video.aussietechheads.com.au or just through the YouTube page and paper.aussietechheads.com.au. It's uh, for the iPad or your, your little iPhone or just on your desktop, whatever, wherever you want. And it's not a paper just of tech news. It's also a paper of oh, everything, business, education, art, entertainment, leisure and more, bringing stories from all over the place. And uh, so you can have a look at that. It's uh, not a bad little thing. All right. Tonight on the show, we've got Eric as usual. And uh, all the way from Code and Go, Chris is back. Hey, Eric and Chris. How are you guys going? Hello. Yeah. Hello. How are you going? Yes, yes. Good, thanks. So, uh, Chris, you're back. You uh, enjoyed yourself last time? I had a blast. <laughs> That's good. I thought I could be a professional comedian, so I'm, I'm back for good. <laughs> and <laughs> 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 and and I think uh, last time we spoke, you were going to deliver a, a talk at the Mobile Sydney. Yeah, like Mobile that. Mondays. That's yeah, that was a lot of fun. Oh, a lot good of fun. Stuff. We did a, did a chat on the four P's of uh, mobile app marketing, and it was, it was good, good fun. Got a lot of good feedback. Stuck the presentation up on, on SlideShare. So, oh, yeah, nice. feel free to take a look. Oh, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. All right, so Chris is going to join us tonight and, uh, yeah, go through a few stories with us. And Eric, how are you going? I'm very well, sir. Um, things are going okay. Very hot day today, thankfully. Yes, so it was warm up here in uh, in Queensland as well. So, uh, as you know, when you're driving along the street, I was out driving around the other day or just today and the other day and you just think, oh, it's just summer. It's just summer day. You know, Feel like it. A- Feel it coming. Yes, there's there's no uh, chill in the there's no bite in the wind. It's just a nice uh, nice uh, hot whoosh on your face. Yes. <laughs> hot, what? what did you say? A hot what? A hot whoosh. A whoosh. Oh, okay. something, something, yeah, something, I'm, yeah. I'm married. We can't go there today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, where do you guys want to? Eric, do you want to start anywhere, or do you want me to throw one out? I would. I'll throw one out there. All right. What do you got? Follow up on, uh, follow up on last week's stories last week's story yes. on the Samsung store. I'm not sure if you've got that on your notes. I do have, it's yes. A, it's it's st- Store Wars, Samsung Apple Gadgets at 10 Paces. Ooh. It's a flagship consumer electronics store on Sydney's George Street with smiling blue shirt wearing staff, a minimalist design and smartphones and tablets that invite customers to pick up and play. But according to Samsung, the new store, just a block from Apple's Sydney store, was all its own idea. Yeah right. yeah, right. The company <laughs> renowned as the fast follower of the market leader is doing little to dispel the notion that it is an Apple copycat. Isn't that why they're in court? Now, I've got a video of the store. Would you like to see it? Oh, I'm just showing some pictures now. But yeah, if you've got a... I've got a video here. and you, you, It's a, it's about a two-minute video, so you have to bear with me. It's not it's not too bad, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, hang on. How do we find that? How do we see that, Eric? No, I, I'm going to... Well, can you hear that? Yep. Hang on, let me. Is that coming through? Yeah. I was, was going to screen share it. Yeah, screen share it. <laughs> All there right, there go. we go. Hi, I'm Phil. Welcome to the Samsung store. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to, uh, to launch tomorrow the Samsung Experience Store. It's all about basically um, consumers picking up or Australia. The audio's really bad. Come in it's terrible, isn't it? offer and how our smart devices actually work together. So whether that's our smart TVs with our smart phones or our smart tablets or with, for example, our smart cameras. And how so they we might have to kill that one, Eric. That's, that's oh, terrible. we got uh, some retail partners. Yeah, are they not doing a good enough job? Is that better? They're doing a great job. And, and we really see this as complementing what they do. At the end of the day, it's uh, basically giving the opportunity for consumers to look and experience what we have to offer. And our partners do so you get an idea of the um, the copycat, right? Yeah. You get a you get a fair idea of um, the store. And, 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 and I'm We're just, really excited. Just, look at this. I'll just show this. 
Right, that's the front there. And you got the, you know, the whole so Apple experience, play with the devices and all that. Look at that. Now, yeah. That's just like an Apple store. You can't yeah. tell me that that's not a copycat Apple store. And they've got the people with the blue shirts. Yeah, yeah right, yes. So yes, yeah, so Samsung. I mean, that's the that's the that, that's the layout now. I mean, when I was, you know, I I, I helped design uh, a carrier store on Pitt Street uh, for a carrier I used to work with and, and work with design folks, and that that's that's kind of your your baseline that you're starting with, making sure that people can touch the devices, so you don't really have a choice to to at least be in the, in that space, you know, table devices, open access, so consumers can touch touch it. Yeah, it's a bit of an Apple knockoff, but that's where everybody is now. You yeah, everyone's know. going because they know it works. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So the so the Samsung opened in Sydney today. Is that right? It was today, Thursday. Today, yeah. Yes, um, today. So located at 450 George Street, and as Eric said, just down the street from Apple. Now, 450 George Street, I think I Googled it again this week, and they've got it right. I think, I think Google Maps hit the right spot this week. So yeah, the, they're on the corner away from each other, across the road, and each, each has it on a corner. So it's the first of its kind for, in Australia for Samsung. Um, the Experience Store has a dedicated app zone, and that gives customers the opportunity to look at the apps that have been developed in, uh, for Australia. Why while there's a play zone, has a lower level table designed for entertaining children. Well, that's always handy. Uh, a range of Samsung and third-party accessories are sold in the store. In addition to selling products outright, Australian consumers can purchase smartphone and tablets through the three main carriers in Australia. So that's that's all right. So no one, you guys haven't been in there yet. Not going to. <laughs> Not interested. I might check it out. Yeah, yeah. oh, you've got to go in and just have a bit of a, a yeah. smell to yeah, see yeah. what have see a what. Laugh. Yeah, have see a look -see. What, yeah, see what goes on. I tell you, the S three uh, or the S the Galaxy S three uh, phone, it's getting a bit of a a, um, a name for itself. It's going gangbusters, from what I hear. Everyone, everyone that gets one loves it. So um, you know, it, it, look, it looks good in the commercials. You know, yeah. everybody I know loves the the the, the oversized <laughs> screen. That, that's definitely where things are going. That's right. And yeah, it's funny that uh, when the mobile phones a few years ago, they all went from the larger, you know, and then they all shrunk. Really yes. Small, you know, and it was a flip phone. It was small. Now they're going back the other way. Yes. Like, like yes. The other swings, isn't it? Remember many years ago the Motorola Razor. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't have a razor, you were just not a cool cat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, look, I remember the analog phones. I think my my, my uh, S1, the Galaxy S1, was the first smartphone that I've ever had. And um, look, I'm oh, looking forward fun. to the iPhone 5. The, look, the, I'm still not talking about iPhone 5 rumors. I hate them. I just wait till next month. They reckon it's coming out, don't they? 21st of September or something. Uh, 12th of September will be the announcement, and they say it'll be for sale either the 21st or the 28th. Right, right. And apparently there's some uh, telco in the US have told everyone not to take any holidays. Uh, yes, I've got it for the last yeah, two weeks. To that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you got there? I've got the story on that. Hang on one second. I think, what was that, Verizon? Yeah, yeah one of, those, uh, one of those customers. That's right. Expected iPhone 5 launch next month will not only tax the resources of Apple, but its carrier partners as well. According to the new report from TechCrunch, Vacation blackouts imposed by Verizon Wireless are in line with rumours about a September 21 iPhone 5 launch. Okay, so it might be earlier than 28. Citing a trusted Verizon employee uh, goes on. Um, yep, yeah, so there you go. Yeah, so Everyone's taking I heard too that uh, T-Mobile have told their staff not to have any holidays and at and t yeah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's all, it's all systems go by the sounds of it. And uh, there was another story, just <laughs> jumping around a bit, but, um, but with the Microsoft, oh, I think that was your story again. I won't, I won't blow that one. <laughs> I think I must have. I read your stories really fast, Eric, and then they stick in my you mind. And, go, oh, they're better than mine. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but, um, but sticking with Apple, apparently through the week you would have heard that Apple was uh, named the most biggest and most valuable company in history. So that was just a yeah. pretty much blanketed all over the place, but but it's come out now and it's reported after the after that that it, it may not have been. So no, I, yes, I know where you're going with this. Continue. 
So what they're saying is that uh, Apple's $622 billion market cap is a nominal record, which means in name only, or alternatively, not really. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense, that sentence? That's because it's a record only if you don't adjust Microsoft's 1999 market cap for inflation. So you have to adjust any number yeah, they, like... You've got to put it in relative terms, correct. So what, it's, what it says here, the value of Ma Microsoft peaked at $620.6 in 1999, okay? So Apple's market cap was 622.5 dollars uh, this week. So when you adjust it for inflation, it requires $1.38 in 2012 dollars to equal $1 in 1999 dollars. Yes. So, so therefore, Microsoft's 620 billion comes out to be 853 billion. Yes. So there you go. Right. <laughs> there you go. So pretty much, so in yeah. Relative uh, terms, in relative terms, it's um, it's uh, Microsoft is still the big, were the biggest. But the sad thing about it is Microsoft are now trading at, um, I'll tell you what they're trading at. Anyone want to take a guess what they're trading at? If they were trading at six hundred and twenty-three billion in nineteen ninety-nine. Oh, what their worth is or their share price? Now, what they know, what their worth is now. Um, uh, let's go, one hundred and fifty. Two hundred and fifty-six billion. Now, if you bought some Microsoft shares when they were worth six hundred and twenty-three billion, you would have paid um, nearly two and a half times their current share price of thirty-one dollars. So you'd be pretty annoyed if you paid seventy-five, eighty dollars for a share and now worth thirty. Thirty bucks or so. Yeah, Ouch. for sure. Ouch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ouch. All right. But um, they haven't been paying dividends, if I remember correctly. So yeah, that that would hurt. Yeah. So where do you reckon that all this this two hundred billion went, or four hundred billion's gone? Has that well, um, share prices tanked? That's all. Yeah, share prices is Not supposed to money. reflect. Yeah, so it's supposed to reflect future value, and you know people are looking at the future and they're saying, okay, Microsoft doesn't have a, a strong foothold in where things are going. That's in either the hardware, or the tablet space, yeah, or in the mobile space. So mm. what you know? What's next for them? They still got their obviously their their linchpin and the operating systems on the PCs, but where, where's the growth going to come from? So so Microsoft trying to figure out and that's where the share price is where it is. That's right. There's, they're not a growth stock anymore. They're a mature stock because they've got their staples that make billions of dollars year in year out. And if you look at their profits, um, if that because they've been around 30 years now, if you look at their current profit, they still make a bucket load of money, billions every year. Now, if that company was 10 years old, it would be classified a growth stock, and its shares may be tri triple what they are now, and the value may be close to Apple, but because they're a 30-year stock, um, and they've, you know, they've been selling the same products for 30 years, they're classified as a growth stock, so the market marks it down, because it's no, as like Chris said, there's nothing exciting there. Mm. Um, classify the Windows tablet exciting. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see about that. And I've got an. I've got a story about that too. I but know. We might as well go on with that. Hey, Glenn. Glenn's, Glenn's going for the surface. I know. I know he is. I know he's in for it. I'm in yeah. for it. Depending on the price, I might give it a look in too. But I'll wait till um. I'll wait till uh, update one, uh, service pack one comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, because I think you've got a story about the uh, about the service, haven't you? Again, uh, I'll tell you. It's not. It's not just me that's excited. I think Steve Bolm is excited. <laughs> as oh, well. Steve Bolm. And he's lost his hair. <laughs> he needs Ashley and Martin. He does. Which, uh, <laughs> that doesn't work. So, um, yeah, so I think your story is about the surface. And yes, the surface. Hang on a second. Why can't I find it? Why can't I find it? You keep talking. All right. I was just going to say, I'm not sure how in-depth that your, your story went into it, but, but with the surface that's coming out, people are given it to Microsoft because uh, they're not even sure, you know, how, how well it's going to go, but they're giving it to them because they've already made, what, 30 million of them? Or oh, whatever it is. Yeah, here it is here. It's written oh, yeah, by John C. Dvorak, minutes. which everyone knows who John C. Dvorak is. Um, it says here, I'll just paraphrase some of this and read a little bit out. When I was a kid, this is what he's writing, my dad used the phrase, going off half-cocked. It originates from the dangerous situation where a gun's firing hammer is not locked in place, ready to shoot and the gun is likely to fire a bullet without someone pulling the trigger. The phrase refers to someone who has not given an idea or a decision, decision much thought. Personally, I did not know you could half-cock a gun. No matter, Microsoft, with zero indication that anyone really wants to even buy one, has decided to make three million of them. Oh, three million. 
Probably not 30. God, imagine three, 30 million. I'd be oh, going they're going to sell. Job. They're going to sell. No, I don't reckon. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't well, it's they? Because it's, because it's Steve Ballmer. You put someone up there with round glasses that looks in a turtleneck and do their keynote speech for them and they'll sell 10 million of them. But <laughs> nah. Like, How many... Steve Ballmer goes out there in a, in a pair of pensioner grey pants and a... Open neck shirt with a bald head, and everyone goes, "Who's this boring git?" Well, who do? You, how many do you reckon iPhone first generation iPhones did they make? Like Apple first generation, they sold. No, but like how many that. did they make in anticipation? Would you estimate more than three million? Uh, well, they sold that pretty quickly, didn't they, Chris? In two thousand and seven, they, they sold. They sold pretty quickly. I think the thing for for Microsoft is, is uh, the point in that article was that they've only got thirty stores and an online outlet, so they they need to find. Some, some retail partners, if they're going to blow through 3 million of them, they're not going to do it through their 30 stores and their online outlet that, uh, that no one knows about. Mm. Yes, right. Well, the, the mathematics here, so he's, John Dvorak's done the mathematics. 30 stores in a mysterious online shop, and if they want to move 3 million tablets, that's 100,000 per store in six months or 16,000 per store each month or 185 tablets a day. If the stores are open 10 hours a day, that means 18 people must buy a Surface each hour at every store. That's one every three minutes. Yeah, but, constant. Like, yeah, but you know, like Microsoft's huge. There's a lot of people in the world. Well, where, where's well, that? Uh, yeah, but this, just, this is the U.S. stats. Mm. So 3 million for the U.S. Look, they'll sell them. In the US. Now, they've got to get partners. They've got to get, like Chris said, they've got to get, get them out to Maya, David Jones, Officeworks, Harvey Norman, um, and Harris Technology. Whoever can, else, can you, they're not, not going to make them available online. online. Well, they should make them available online. They'd be crazy not to, because that is the best distribution outlet that they've got. Yeah, outside of America. Yeah, look, if, if I was look, honestly, if I was in the market for a for an iPad, I would, I'd wait, I'd wait to see what the what the service is going to be. You know, especially if it's going to integrate and talk to your PC. Like, why well, this is what we don't know. We don't know. There's no. There's no excitement. There's no rumors. There's no. There's no. There's no one going out there trying to get pictures of a Microsoft tablet and going. Well, let's see how this thing works. Let's pull it apart. And, you know. There's, there's no. Um, no one knows. Yeah. In in every week for the last what must be three months, maybe more. Every week, as you go through the news stories for the for the coming week to find out, you know, what we're going to talk about tonight. There's all. There's like uh, this week's iPhone rumors. This week's roundup of iPhone rumors, and it just keeps going on and on and they've on. Got site, they've got websites dedicated to iPhone rumors. You know, if you go to macrumors.com, it's just dedicated to Apple rumors. There's no, there's no winrumors.com because it'd, it'd be one visit a day. No one cares. <laughs> yes. Well, talking about the the Windows 8, if we were, and the and the. And the yeah, uh, the you get one, aren't you? you? Love it. I do love it. I do. I do. I want one. Now the Windows Eight. There's there's activation is changing. I don't know if you read about this, but Microsoft. Remember in Windows Seven, you could uh, install Windows Seven and use it for thirty days before you had to activate yes. it. Well, yes. that's going to come to a halt, a screaming halt, apparently. Uh, so oh, Windows Eight, you're not going to be able to do that. The, the change, uh, blah, blah, blah. With Windows 7, yep, the grace period was used by some to evaluate the software, yep. Um, and then what they were doing there was, that's right, they were, there were people that were doing the shortcut where they could uh, put, the, put the trial on, the 30-day trial, and then instead of buying the full version, then they'd just buy the upgrade because the trials were already on the machine and then the machine would right. be ready to expect an upgrade, so therefore buy the cheaper version. And, um, yeah, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's stopped. So Windows 8, you're going to have to put the key in straight away and register it straight away. Well, so, I've, I've got, I've got a um, TechNet um, subscription, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. Oh, but you're not even yeah. going to install it. I'm not even going to install it anyway. Now, Chris, do you have <laughs> PCs where you are? In Sydney? Yeah, yeah. I'll probably, yeah, we, we, we've come out of the Stone Age and we yeah. have some here. <laughs> That's good. You're, much, you're still, right, still running Windows 95, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, um, I'll, prob I'll probably give it a go. I will probably give it a go. I, you know, seeing seeing some of the stuff that I've seen on the on on the phone side, uh, I'll probably have to check it out. Yeah, I, oh, I did, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just going to say I was just listening to a podcast during the week. I think it would have been on one of, on one of Leo's shows. That apparently Apple and Microsoft have got a patent licensing agreement for Microsoft to. To use certain aspects of the iPhone iOS, and the deal was you can use whatever you want from our iOS, 
but your 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 um what's called your user interface your, your GUI yep not look anything like ours yeah okay right because so basically always... you can have it all but so the back end and how it all operates and how the, the you know the swipe and the click mm. to unlock and all this sort of stuff you can have all that but you can, that's why they came up with the tiles that's why their phone is completely different to everybody else so why do you think that this is happening why do you think that they're having to get well, in? I think agreement that yeah, okay. I think Mark approached them and, and said, look, we want to, you know, use your stuff. And they said, yeah, no problem, but as long as you can use it, but you cannot look anything like ours. Maybe it's the Jobsies thing of um, just want to kill Google. Well, yeah, keep, I, keep, I think it keep is. Keep in mind, with, with all, all those big companies own a lot of patents. And so, you know, Apple's paying Samsung for patents that they're using in, mm. in the iPhone and and Samsung's getting, you know, Microsoft is going to pay Apple. They're all paying each other for patents. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and this whole court case is just a big pissing contest, yeah. Frank, but because yeah. some people don't want other people to use, you know, pieces of their pat, some of their patents, or are disputing whether or not they own a particular patent that someone's using. Or they use it without permission and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, everybody, you know, everybody's got a whole bunch of patents, and all these phones, none of them are 100% original. And so, uh, so they have to be paying, you know, the other guys for patents. So I was reading through the week. Now I'm not sure the exact uh, the exact company here. I think it was Xerox. But but you know when the that Apple took Microsoft to court, or they they jumped up and down about how Microsoft stole their you know the Windows and the mouse and all that. Yeah, the Windows look. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And all that sort of stuff. Well, well, apparently after it went to court, I think it got that far that it went to court or, or whatever, and then they had to both agree that they had both. They neither of them invented it. They they got it from Xerox or somewhere. So the origins of Xerox, the... uh, well, that's not completely true. Um, what what Apple saw at Xerox didn't look anything like their final operating system. They did what Microsoft are doing now with the iOS. They took it and went, yes, we can use the basics, the fundamentals of that to build our own. And that's what they did with the Xerox stuff. Because the zero the zero park stuff did look nothing like the operating system that Apple eventually came out with, but they used the idea and the concept to come out with their own. What Microsoft did with Windows was copy it blatantly, but now it's gone full circle, and Microsoft are using Apple's stuff to get the basics and the back end and get how get it to work, you know, very snappily and all that sort of stuff. So it's that sort of we'll, we'll use your ideas, but we, it's not going to look the same. And Apple uh, Apple stuff back then never looked the same as Xerox stuff. But apparently, like Apple never won that case because because it went back to the well, you didn't invent it either. You know, yeah, it always goes back to prior art when you're talking about patents. If if and it doesn't have to look the same for the judge to say, well, you've lost that case. Mm. Well, was that that recently? The judge said the the iPad looked better than the the Galaxy Tab, so he threw that one out. Yeah, they said uh, <laughs> looked better. <laughs> Samsung looked crap. So, <laughs> all right. Now, well, well, while we're still on tablets, and geez, everyone seems to be talking about them. The Galaxy Note ten point one has launched in Australia. So, uh, Chris, what do you know about the the, the ten point one Galaxy Note? You're going to get one of these little babies. Is that a um, Samsung? Mate? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's a Samsung. Uh, I actually think it'll probably be pretty good. It'll be interesting to see if, if they can bring the stylus back. You know, it's probably been since uh, since the Palm was out with the with the trio, where the, the stylus was was still in. But uh, I was talking to after the Mobile Monday event a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to uh, to someone who had some insights, and they are they believe that the stylus will come back. So uh, wow, you know, bring the, sexy. they're bringing sexy back. <laughs> they're, they're they're bringing sexy back, uh, and and you know a lot of people. What, what they were saying is for professionals who are doing things like like what you see in that picture, drawings and, and the like. Uh, you need a stylus. You can't do those things with your fingers. So maybe it's a professional device. Okay, yeah, uh, right. I'm not sure. We'll we'll, we'll see. So have look, to I agree. With you. I agree with you, Chris. Um, I think if they do this properly, it'll sell very well for that reason. Mm -hmm. So, so some stats on the prices and whatever, because this is now available in the Experience Store in uh, Sydney. Now, it confirmed the 16 gig Wi-Fi only uh, is the first to go on sale at 589, and the 3G model uh, has is coming. So, there's only one out. It's only the 16 gig Wi-Fi at the moment. They'll eventually. That's, that's, what, that's what amazes me about Samsung. They, 
they they've come out with these obviously you're quite a quite a well accepted tablet but they don't give you a choice you know instead of coming out with a 16 gig wi-fi and 3g and a 32 gig wi-fi and 3g or whatever it gives you you know so you get a a better cross-section of people who want to buy your stuff it just amazes me that they didn't come out with you know some choices well they would have make more sales that way well they're, they're coming so maybe they just didn't know how the market would react to them unlike microsoft and maybe they only made like a thousand or something who knows but uh, Samsung will eventually sell a 32 gig Wi-Fi, apparently for 6.99, and a 16 gig 3G model is also coming out around about 7.29. Uh, yeah, so they're all, they're all going on. So the stylus is back. It's back. Yeah, back. I hope you don't hope they've got a little slot for it because you'd lose those buggers. Yeah, there must be something in there somewhere. But like, you yeah, have to have that sounds like an eBay business, eBay opportunity to me replacing stylus. Replacing stylus. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Because they're, they're made of a, a special tip, aren't they? They're not just a... Chris, you, that's what you do, mate. You, that's what you do. You go to, go to China, you say, I want to make these styluses, and you just eBay shop it, and you'll be surprised how much money you'll make. That, that's exactly right. You know, selling for five bucks a pop, people ordering ten at a time, it's laughing. Yeah. Can I patent that idea? Can I patent that idea? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, uh, we've, got, we've got a competition to, uh, to happen. Over the coming month, you're so, gonna win a Samsung Galaxy Tab. No, nothing like nothing like that. But something is equally as good, equally as good. You can win from and thank you to to Frosty, uh, one of our great listeners. He's donated a PC copy of Battlefield Three, limited edition, still sealed in the wrapper, untouched by human hands. This thing, so you can win this thing from the House of Frost, and all you have to do is send us something. Send us an MP3. Or a video, load, upload it to YouTube and uh, of a review or whatever, whatever you want. Take a picture of yourself uh, listening to the show somewhere, somewhere pretty crazy. That'd be that'd be funnier. Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll do that for the next couple of weeks, and we'll do that at the end of September uh, as a as a grand final, footy grand final thing. But uh, also, you can, just before you, just before you go, does it say on the on the box there? Frosty might want to type it in the, in the chat room there. What specs you need for your computer? All right, we'll get we'll get onto it. Well, if you if you're worried about that and we can't find those out right now, just Google them. I'm sure that you'll be fine. It's Battlefield Three PC Edition. Now, just send everything uh, to Glenn at AussieTechHeads.com.au and you'll be right. And talking of the footy, the footy competition, uh, the uh, the Aussie Tech Heads footy competition. I tell you, it's heating up now. Coming to the end of the season, we've got Chalkster in the lead in the NRL competition. He doesn't lead by much. But good on you, Chalkster. I think you, you can take it out if you're good enough. And Eastside Boy, you are flying in the ARL competition. No one's going to beat you. So, uh, so I'm going to go through the, the little prize box at the end of the, end of the footy comp and we'll find something for, those, for you guys as well, whoever wins that. Uh, all right. So let's get back to some stories. <coughs> what else have we got here? Uh, cheaper mobile roaming prices. All right. Now... Well, I read this story, and I, is, it, is it just, I don't know, maybe Eric or Chris can put me on the right, right direction here, but I thought, like, if you went overseas, the best, what, what, the best thing to do is to get an old, to, is to get a, uh, a phone from that, a throwaway phone from that country. And, um, well, you can, or just bring your own phone and get a SIM card from the country. Yeah, if it's unlocked. So why can't... Well, most phones are unlocked from Australia. Most phones are unlocked. So why... Most of them are locked, but they're pretty easy to unlock. Yeah, so there, there's, um, you know, the, there's a government inquiry into this thing called Bill Shock or Roaming Shock or, or whatever you want to call it. It's uh, a <laughs> shock. Bull shock. So a load of bull. They're looking at options for reducing mobile roaming costs, and apparently it's only between us and New Zealand. Uh, they reckon the telcos are really, you know, charging exorbitant roaming fees and all this sort of stuff. But I don't understand. Like, I still, what, are people just taking their phone over, not sort of researching it or not looking into how they can maybe reduce? Well, I've got, a, I've got a question, rhetorical question. Um, hmm, how do I phrase this without insulting anyone? Bugger it, I'll just phrase it. <laughs> uh, if you can afford to get yourself on a plane to go overseas... Surely you're smart enough to know what to do about roaming. Because hmm. if you don't know how that works, where are you, and that obviously means you're that stupid, where are you getting enough money for an airfare? Yeah, so, because I know, look, look I, I, don't, I don't 
go overseas. But I know when I went on a cruise and that was overseas, well, yeah, you just re- you just knew not to use the, the mobile phone because of the, the roaming charges. And if you did, you were expecting a you know an SMS to cost you four bucks or something. But, That's right. Uh, I think what happens is, 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 is there's a couple things. So let's say you, you even know, hey, I need to go get another phone, but maybe uh, it's going to take you a day or two to get that phone. You turn on your phone and you think, I'm just going to use it for a day or two. Mm. But the data charges are so steep that, that day or two ends up costing several hundred dollars, and you go, "What? What? How did? Where did that come from? How did that happen?" Yeah. And uh, you know, it, it it can definitely sneak up on you. You, know, you, you, you literally need crazy. to get off the flight, go straight to the. Yeah. You know, the, the Vodafone shop in the airport and get your SIM card, you know? Right away. That's exactly right. You don't wait a couple of days because there are, there are those SIM shops at every airport and there are dozens of them. Yeah. So why, yeah. why do you think that the, the roaming charges are it's such it's so expensive, Chris? Like, have you got the, what other reason is there? But is that so, just... Well, <laughs> having worked at a carrier, uh, in, in part, it's the uh, uh, inter-carrier charges. So you go on someone else's network... Uh, they, they charge the carrier that you have back in, in, in your country for access to the network, and then that carrier puts a margin on top of that. Sometimes those, those, those costs are, are exorbitant for mm-hmm. no real reason, uh, only because they can and because it, it, it hits people at the margins. You know, yeah. it doesn't hit, doesn't hit 98% of the people who signed up, you know, who, yeah. who are on Optus or yeah, Voter. Yeah. They can do it because they know you've got no choice. Because as far as I know, like like with Australia Post, because you know how you get postage from overseas and all that sort of stuff, uh, isn't it just like an international agreement with the, the post offices around the world that they'll just carry an overseas item for nothing? Because I'm sure Australia Post don't sit down at the end of the month and, you know, and, and charge Hong Kong thousands of dollars for delivering all the eBay items. So I think it's. I, I'm, you play, yeah, I'm sure the there right is some there. reconciliation going on. You you know, I'm sure there's some reconciliation, but but yeah, the, but the you're the 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 right at, the, at the source. A lot of the time, you know, you go to post something from Hong Kong, and they've got their charges. What it's going to cost you to to throw something from eBay, you know, that weighs yeah. you know half a kilo. Yeah. They're going to say, well, that's thirty dollars, please, and yeah. that's it. Pay it, and that's how it gets through. I don't think people are putting fifty cent stamps on eBay things and going, "Oh, stuff it." Australia Post will wear it. No, no, but yeah. I mean, but but do, but do you think uh, that there's some sort of yeah financial reconciliation going on to say so Australia Post will pay Hong Kong something or Hong Kong will pay? No, I don't. I don't think so. Not on postage. You've heard, could you imagine how long that would take? Mm. Yeah. Million past, no? I thought it was a re- just like a reciprocal agreement. Oh, probably for uh, those items that, don't, that happen to have not enough postage, like a postcard that was sent with a 20-cent stamp from, you know, Estonia that should have been a 50-cent stamp. They probably let that slide. But I wouldn't say I, – I think they wouldn't do it with big parcels. But, but Chris, do you think there's some sort of financial – Yeah, I think I think there's there's some reconciliation going on. Mm. You know, that, that's, that, that's why your pricing is different everywhere. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. You know, because because you know, from from our post perspective, you're just getting it to the, you know, to the to the to the boat. Mm. That price doesn't change regardless of where you're sending it to. But you're gonna pay something different for sending something to Hong Kong versus sending it to Los Angeles. The Australia Post was also uh, in the in the tech news this week because they were in court just for, <laughs> for someone else going to court. Um, but but uh, they're up against a place called I think it was Digital Post Australia, uh, where that was a, a online you can send secure messages. So it's not like email, but uh, you're, once you set it up, it's like a digital post box. Uh, you only, uh, emails only come through if you've authorised them or whitelisted them, uh, and it's a digital post box. And uh, apparently Australia Post and Telstra have teamed up, also uh, have teamed up to also bring some sort of digital post box thing. And they thought that the digital post Australia was a bit too close to Australia Post. They went to court, judge said, no. Nah. Later. Yeah, but uh, but did these guys have that idea first? Who the other guys? The Digital Post, or yeah. well, they're they're, they're, well, they, they're in the market first. They're here. They just yeah. didn't like the name. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that? they didn't like the name. They just didn't like the name. The name. They didn't like the name. Yeah, but that's just tough cookies. They were there first. Well, that's that's what I reckon. Yeah, and that's what the judge thought as well. Yeah, they they just got to market first. Uh, Australia Post obviously just sat back a bit and just. Um, I don't know. Maybe didn't think about trademarking their their name in the in that particular sphere. Well, it's Digital Post Australia. It's completely different to Digital Australia Post. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And look, it's similar, but uh, it's different. It's similar, but the words are backwards. Yes. <laughs> Post Australia, not Australia Post. Yeah, that's stupid. This is deals. Same thing. Lawyer that advised him to go court on that one. He should be shot. This is this is a picture of the the Australia Post CEO when he found out. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> now, uh, what? Else, where else are we going? Chris, did you have any any stories or anything to that that caught your attention through the week? <laughs> there were a few things I thought that was interesting. First is how rough Facebook is taking it <laughs> since oh. they've gone public. Yes. They, yeah, they're down every night you turn on, they're dropping. Uh, they're down to half their float price, aren't they, Chris? Half the float price. Zuckerberg is getting ripped apart in, in, in the media. It's so funny. I mean, it, what, it was, what, two months ago? He was the, yeah. the hottest thing going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the nouveau CEO. Now they're, now they're already talking about getting rid of him. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I heard that. They're talking about getting rid of him because he's, yeah, they got to do. They got to turn the the share price around. Turn turn the fortunes. Or, or around. It, it, at least the critics are talking about it. Uh, yeah. I think he still owns <laughs> too much stock and is way too powerful. He, he's he's a figurehead now. He, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, so. well, that, but that's a classic case of entrepreneurs are not necessarily good CEOs. You know, <laughs> I, I I think there's 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 a structural challenge for any business like theirs that. Uh, whose foundation is not something that you sell directly to your users, but something ancillary like advertising on your site when everything's moving to mobile. You know, basically his challenge isn't that that uh, that he in per se is doing a poor job. It's that no one's figured out how to monetize mobile at a scale that's going to be commensurate with what you're doing on the web. Yeah, correct. And so you know, what, 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 so that if there was any issue problems it was the fact that the daggone issue price got pumped up so daggone much before they went to market that uh you know they priced themselves beyond where they could actually reasonably expect to to maintain the um you know you're right about that because most people i oh know i do um access facebook on my phone very yeah. rarely will i log into a website well that's what they're saying and they, they're, they're, their usage is moving to the mobile uh so fast that while they're, they're still going to grow in terms of their advertising spend on the web, uh, the revenue is off the web, but their viewership's going to mobile. And so how are they going to monetize that? They can't do it at the same rate that they do on the web. So right. that, again, you come back to the Microsoft issue that we spoke about earlier. Where's the future growth going to come from? Because these guys are priced as a growth stock. Yeah, mm. that's right. They were priced, exactly. And now they, everyone's going, well, are they a growth stock or are they a stagnant? Mm -hmm. So they have, they have to recreate their business model, and you know, granted, they got some smart people over there. I, oh, I yeah, they're some, a very, he, and he's a very smart there. guy. He's just, I think, he's caught between a rock and a hard place, isn't he? Look at it. If you look at it, like say in comparison to say Google, you know, Google has been fortunate in that their baseline business model they initially launched with is still able to carry them, similar to the way that Microsoft does. Yeah, Facebook's. Is a little bit different than their baseline business model because remember they didn't have a business model in the beginning it was just get lots of users yes. so their baseline business model became you know web advertising and now if that underlying business model is changing they have to figure out something that they can replace it with that gives them the scale that that gives them you know so google if you look at google you know what have they done over the last 10 years they've experimented with eight million different ways other ways to make money but still the overwhelming lion's share of money comes from search. That's What's right. What's going to happen for Facebook where they're, they're, they're going to experiment with a bunch of different ways to make money, whether it's right. e-commerce, you know, social commerce, I should say, or, or the like. They've got to figure out what's going to give them some scale that's going to allow them to grow at scale. And that's it's going to be a challenge. It is. I agree. I agree. It sure will be. And uh, now you've also, you also put up, threw up a story here, Chris, about the, the um, Google Marketplace. And, yeah. Yes, and the uh, the feds have come in and and seized what was the name of it? The uh, Apple App Planet. Yeah, there's a few different app stores that the feds came in and said, "Whoa, you guys are are, are trading in pirated materials." Uh, app Planet and App Bucket are the two big ones. But basically, what these folks are doing is they were stealing they were stealing Android apps that um, that were being sold. Uh, you know, on a paper download basis, sticking them in their own store, the stolen uh, 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 apps, and then reselling them. 
no, and that's... making money off of them. So the developers weren't getting paid or anything. So, uh, yeah, it, it was good to see the authorities swoop in on that. And, and, and Google's been implementing a number of uh, initiatives to try and reduce the piracy rate because it's, it's a huge challenge. But, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that's when you go, okay, basically these guys just set up, set up a website, stole a bunch of apps and went, let's sell them to people and make money. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, so the so that's the app planet. So that that's obviously been taken down. You can't can't go to that anymore. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. And I think and Chris, you're, you're on fire because you got another one. <laughs> you got another one here about uh, use of what's that? Oh, Google. Google use our payment system or we'll kill your app. What What was that? What did you say? What did you say? So Google has has is is going to be forcing developers to use Google Wallet in their app, in their Android apps that are sold through the Google Play Store so that people purchasing are all having the same purchase experience. Um, it's interestingly, the article talked about a big uproar and the like amongst developers and, and, and whatnot. But in reality, that's what Apple has been doing the entire time. You've mm-hmm. got to, you've got to use Apple's, Apple. uh, you know, in-app billing. Uh, SDK in order to charge for anything within your app, and what it does in in the Apple ecosystem is it means that you got a consistent, smooth purchasing experience. And of course, Apple has 200 million credit cards on file, so that makes it nice and simple. Mm. Well, Google's trying to get their piece of the payments pie as well, and uh, and it's going to end up hurting folks like PayPal and other payment providers who, up till now, developers have been able to use them in their in their apps. But, uh, but now I'm going to have to switch to Google Wallet and uh, so you this, know, and, and, and use Google Wallet. So this is uh, this is going to happen. This is not up for discussion. This is just going to happen. Put like this, we at Code and Go, we've been talking to partners, billing partners who uh, who are actively looking for additional channels uh, for their for for their developers and publishers that they work with because they know that this is coming down the pike mm. and uh, and that they're no longer going to be uh, in the in the Google Play stores. So with the uh, yeah, so the Google Wallet. Although you can't you can't open a Google Wallet account in Australia, is that right? But you can still use the still use it to purchase stuff. That is that that that's the challenge for uh, uh, for Google is the overall acceptance of Google Wallet isn't what it needs to be all over the world. Mm. So you stick your Google Wallet in there. Well, if you're selling in certain markets through Google Play Store, no one uses it. So you're not going to get any sales. You're not going to get any, yeah. make any money in those markets. So, so Google's got to do some work to get get greater penetration and acceptance of Google Wallet as a as a payment method. Because uh, a couple of couple of years ago, wasn't it eBay went down a, a similar track where they just wanted nothing else but PayPal payments. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I think there was a bit of an uproar about that, and then they decided to bring in back in the you know debit bank accounts and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I think yeah that they tried they tried they failed and and maybe Google as you said with the the um the the, the complexity of implementing this around the world maybe that would take them a bit of time or, or you know give them a bit of a couple of there, headaches. There, there's there's, a, there's an upside and a downside for consumers. It'll at least mean that you're more likely to get a consistent purchasing experience whenever you buy uh, an Android app through Google Play. That's great. If you're a publisher, Google charges more than some of the other payment providers. So you're going to lose out there, um, uh, and 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 you lose the freedom and flexibility to choose the payment provider that you want to choose. So there's a there's some different mm. there's some different solutions being worked on out there to kind of help developers and publishers manage through this because it basically means more work for developers uh, having to pick and choose different yeah. uh, payment processors to, to to build into your app. So that just means more sitting behind the computer making alternate versions of the exact same app with different SDKs and and, and, and the like. So we'll yeah. see where it goes. Yeah, so talking about uh, maybe uh, Google could head over to eBay and, and, and buy themselves a spell uh, <laughs> before the end of August <laughs> because no longer until you've got till the 30th of August this year, you will no longer be able to buy spells on eBay. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> I know, isn't that ridiculous? Um, what am I going? To, are they going to honor the ones that I currently have? <laughs> they're going to. They're going to upgrade to Spell Two Point <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So, uh, tarot reading, 
tarot reading cards, uh, spells, curses, and blessings are among the intangible categories being removed by eBay. Like, why, why didn't I know about this before? I could have come up with a few what? spells. I could have thrown one. You've been missing out. Yeah. You've been missing out. Why, like, seriously, why didn't we think of this, eh? Like, how hard can it be? <laughs> the decision has been made uh, because of the conflicts between buyers and sellers. Uh, of the services are difficult to resolve and all listings of this kind will be re- removed in September. So here's a little little quote that the whatever art where where this article come from uh, looks like BBC so they've gone out they've got a quote off someone uh, lady Michelle Hobbs from Dorset I bought a spell on eBay to help a relative who was having difficulties at work and we were amazed by the results. <laughs> See? <laughs> They're going to take this away from people. <laughs> Are they serious? <laughs> They're taking it away, I, taking the fun away. I think they should take the people away. They probably Good. should. They probably should. But how I, I think I, I think Eric, those are those same people who are getting those flights and uh, and hopping <laughs> off and, and then surfing the web. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate <laughs> because you can't legislate against stupidity. You can't. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many laws you've got. If people are morons, they're going to get in trouble. Mm. But talking of uh, stuff that eBay doesn't let you have, well, I remember the old man had a uh, a couple of old rabbit traps. And like they were pretty old, like as so they were vintage. This is your or, dad, yeah. Your dad had a rabbit trap. Yeah, yeah, rabbit trap slash fox. Oh, you used trap. to live on a farm. That's right. You had a you were on a farm at one point, weren't you? So it was an old one, you know. We had to like you know claw it open like that, and <laughs> oh, they're they're deadly. Well, we put on eBay because you know they they're antiques, and yes. then eBay told us to get stuffed. <laughs> They took it straight down. <laughs> and Those are antique killing machines. Okay. <laughs> That's right. It was a cruelty to animals uh, machine. You should and I put it back up there as a rabbit trap spell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to ward away myxomatosis. <laughs> That's right. A vintage stylus. Yeah. That's right. There you go. Five bucks. Made yeah. in China. And uh, so also over in, how's this, you know, we're, we've talked about piracy a lot on the show and, and how we don't think it's all going to work. I think these the companies and the, the media creators and all this, they've got to change their, their business models and all this sort of stuff. The software, then the Pirate Bay, some guy, so there's a lot of uh, ISPs around the world now that are blocking the Pirate Bay. And so some guys made up a little program that a small piece of software engineered by a fan of the Pirate Bay allows users to find the website by typing in its real domain, even if their ISP has blocked the site. So this utility called the Pirate Patch. (laughs) The Pirate Patch. It's great, isn't it? Uh, So so, uh, modifies the computer's host file, which is used to match domain names of websites with an IP address. The Pirate Patch modifies the host file to direct requests for the piratebay.se through proxy servers that aren't blocked by the ISP. So there you go. It doesn't seem no matter what, what uh, say, the authorities want to do or try and do, there's always going to be a way around it. But um, I suppose th- what they could, the only thing, you know, the, the content creators could hope for is maybe just to make it so hard people can't be bothered. But Because uh, that's, getting, that's getting pretty hard, isn't it? Got to go down and get a little patch and, and do it. But um, <clears throat> Now, during the week, speaking of that, this is a question without notice. When they put in the this ridiculous privacy busting um, internet filter. Yes. Surely someone can come up with a way to get around it. I don't want anyone tr- bloody knowing what I've, what sites I've been on. I, I mean, I don't do anything stupid, but, you know, it's a privacy issue. So I don't want <laughs> telcos having access to, you know. So this is a story, I think, Eric, that you were – I didn't actually read too much of this story, but it's about the government being being uh, able to access or is it even keep your, your search history? Yeah, they, they're they saying that they can keep it for how long, I'm not sure. I think it's a, a week. Two years, so, I believe it was. Two, was it two years? Yeah. Um, and they've, it's been watered down a little bit, but apparently it's still a lot more um, strict than the European one. And they can um, they can only they can only give the information to the to the police if they've got a warrant. Whereas the one they wanted before was they can give it to the police without a warrant. But does it go as far as 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 uh, requiring the ISPs to keep a, a log of this? 
Why can't they just destroy <laughs> well, the they library? Have to cut the log, otherwise, they can't ask for it. But for how long, I don't know. Two years. Like but yeah, so that, it's in the it's in the legislation, and that the, the log is required to be kept. Well, because otherwise, yeah. the ISPs would just turn and say, "Well, we don't keep the logs, so you can't. There's right. nothing to get." But yeah, but uh, now Woolworths, you've been, you, everyone shops at Woolies and probably uh, done the the pay wave or used the pay wave at some stage. So Coles has come up, have introduced their pay pass, which is the Mastercard. Mastercard derivative or Mastercard alternative, so I can't see where this is really going. I oh, know, well, obviously, well, Mastercard wanted to have some sort of setup going along, but does that mean that if you've got, say, you, you can't swipe your visa across a, a pay pass, a Mastercard machine, and vice versa? So I don't know where that's uh, where that's going. You got to have what a merchant's got to have two machines. Who knows? But the Coles has deployed Mastercard pay pass technology across 749 stores, enabling customers with eligible credit cards to pay without having to sign or provide a personal identification number. Customers can use the PayPass system for purchases under 100 bucks. Uh, according to MasterCard Australia, head of market development, blah, 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 um, the deal with Coles means that there are now 100,000 PayPass terminals in operation across Australia. So that's, uh, that's great. That's great. All right. So... What else is going on? <laughs> I've lost the I've lost the vi- the video. I think Google Google uh, Hangout has died again. So that's no good. That's no good at all. We'll um we'll just stop it there and we'll we'll come back and have a look at this. All right, what happened then? What you, you just dropped out, mate. I know, it was me. What's going yeah. on? I did drop we out. Were, we were chatting away and... It was me. And nothing happened. All right, well, we better start recording again. Okay, good, we're nearly finished. All right, so have you got any more yeah. stories, Eric? No, no, let's just, just drop off on this one. Now, two years now. Oh, hang on. <laughs> My question is, is hey. there any way to block yeah. so that your IP doesn't get your, your data? For example, so that when if the police go and say, "Oh, we've got a warrant for this IP address," and they go, "Well, that's all well and good, but we've got no data for that." Mm. I don't. I don't think so. No, because uh, I'm uh, sure uh, someone's going to come up with a way to do it. It'll probably might be a, a at a be a, at a router level. But I mean, possibly. how? But how much like digging? Give us some sort of spoofing, spoofing uh, IP or something. But it depends on how much digging that they want to do. Because, because obviously, yeah, you can you can you can go through a proxy and pretend to be somewhere else, and, and and so forth. But I suppose they've got to keep track back back tracking and following you back to the source. Like, it wouldn't be an easy job, but I suppose if you, I, don't I know. reckon someone will someone will come out of it. Come, someone will come up with something, and I hope they do. But the ISP knows who you are because they provide you the connection. Yeah, they know who I am. But if they've got no information of where I've been, I can't be accused of anything. So you'd right. have to you'd, you'd have to find a site, yeah, like some sort of proxy place yeah. where where but you. But I know what's going to happen. I know it'll happen. Someone will come up with something that will enable you to spoof your email address at the router level, and then they'll bring in a law that makes that illegal. That's what they'll do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they. You, you know, like yeah. speed cameras. You know, speeding's yeah. a speeding's a, uh, breaking the law. But if you've got a speed camera, you can avoid it. But now speed cameras are illegal. Hmm. That's what they'll do. This is the equivalent of a speed camera, or of a radar trap camera. Yeah, because I know, like, if you if you go through the proxy a proxy server, well, it's just going to slow your browsing down. That's why that that's the downside that's, of that's using it. one of those yeah. sort of things. But look, yeah. I think at the end of the day, you're a number, and you're going to get you're going to get found. I reckon doesn't matter what what happens. So, um, jerks, I want to move. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the best thing you could do then would be to to get a wireless a, a SIM card in a fake name. And then go and do it on that. I oh, know. I've got to go and <laughs> spend ten thousand bucks on a fake passport and shit. Yes. <laughs> That's no good. Oh, Someone well. to help me. Them's the brakes. Them's the brakes. All right. Uh, anyway. All right, boys. This is where I have to have to check out. I've got a development team call with my folks in Macedonia. No worry. On the on the Google. How do you say hello in Macedonian? <laughs> That's a good question. I'll find it out for next next time we're on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thanks, Chris. And if, if anyone wants to, what's your Twitter? 
What's your Twitter? Uh, our Twitter is at app submissions, at app submissions, app submissions. Check us out. All right, and you, and uh, Chris's webpage is code and go c o d e n g o dot com. That's correct. How's that? So if you if you've got if you're developing for the Android. Uh, platform, you want to go and check that out because he'll submit it to a hundred, so a hundred different stores for you. How's we'll it? get it into a lot of places so you can sell and get lots of downloads. That's exactly oh, what we're doing. Chris, for. before you go, did you um, get in contact with your your money, the money people? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I was actually just emailing back with him a bit today. So thank All you right, for that. Good stuff. Good on you. Good, good stuff. Well done. He oh. was updated. All we'll right, do. We'll see right, you. Mate. We'll see you next time, Chris. Thanks for stopping in. Thanks, My Chris. pleasure. No worries. Cheers. Right. Well, that's just going to round us out about two. Yes, we're um, we better go because it's near the end of the show. Unless Eric, you've got any more more stories? One more. One more. Parliament House gets free Wi-Fi. Good on them. What blocks? <laughs> but it blocks blacklisted sites from the open network. The Department of Parliamentary Services has committed to spending. $10,000 a year on free Wi-Fi for visitors, politicians, and employees of Parliament House. Ten grand a year. That's a lot of bandwidth. Do you think it's that much? Ten grand? Yeah. No, or is that just typical Labor government wasting money? Well, must, must be that. They're probably putting antennas in, every, in probably in the toilet. So they, they, they can use them in the toilet. Who knows where yeah. they're putting them? They're, they're, yeah, but they're probably putting them in every corridor, in you know, every hallway. Probably. Yeah, that, well, that's that's true. But ten thousand a year—that sounds like a bandwidth cost. Well, rather yeah, than a, as a, as it rolls a, on. Then a then a like, like a rollout one off. Yeah, that's thing. crazy. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, wouldn't it be best just to put a, a wireless router in every MP's office and just feed it off? Yeah, and run it and, and like and say, is Milo no MBN question mark? So, well, that's right. Good point. Can't mm. they just run a Fiber into the Canberra, for God's sake! Yeah, a couple. Even if you got a couple of fiber um, connections and put them through a, a router that that bonded them together, and you you spend a couple of hundred bucks on on a router, one up cost of you know five hundred routers or hundred routers at two hundred dollars each, and then that's it. Then you're only then you're only up for you know a hundred dollars a month, three hundred dollars a month. Yeah, times three. That's it. Um, Bonded connections. It does Can't sound excessive. Hard. It sounds excessive. It should, it should cost them only four thousand dollars a year. But mm. you know, Labor government, it's always three times what it should be. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Well, Labels. um yes, that's right. So show notes are available at the AussieTechheads.com.au website. Uh, after the show, go around and if there's anything that you want to go further into or want to want to read the actual article that we speak about, just go to the show notes. Uh, also the the Twitter news feed is is at Aussie Tech News. That's A U W S I E T E C H N E W S. That'll just plop, you know, a couple of news stories every half an hour or so into your little, little, I don't know, push notification or in your little stream, whatever. So have a look at that. And also, look, Audible's still around, audible.com. You can still go to the, the uh, Aussie Tech Head page, sign up to Audible, and get your free book. So you can do that. We will probably, uh, should probably, might do an Audible review next week, get back into the swing. And yeah. also, oh. So that's about it. Thanks, Brad. Techwebcast.info for the allows us to rebroadcast his show before the show on Thursday nights. If you're tuning in live for the lounge, good stuff, everyone. All right. So once again, uh, yeah, that's that's another end of a show. So thanks, Eric. Thanks for coming on. Welcome. And I think uh, hi, Will. Wherever you are, I think he's the wedding's next week. So um, yes. The, it's all, uh, it's all, it's all systems go there, and also uh, we had yeah Chris from codeandgo.com. So go and check them out as well. All right, so thanks Lounge, thanks uh, listeners, and thanks anyone who's watching us on the video. So until next week, it's bye for now. Ta-da.